physician computer company. PCC empowers independent pediatricians, streamlining daily operations and improving financial stability. A trusted pediatric partner for 40 years, we offer award-winning support, personalized training, seamless data transitions, and practice analytics. With inclusive pricing, a lively peer community, and a free annual users conference, you can focus on what matters the most, your patients. Explore more at PCC.com. That is PCC.com. Good morning, George. It's March 12th. It's a Tuesday morning, and it happens to be my parents' 59th wedding anniversary. Of course, I'm the youngest one, so I'm not even 40 yet, but. <laughs> today, we have a great guest, Dr. Ilan Shapiro. His title today is going to be Pediatrics and Advocacy in Social Media. And, and thank you for the opportunity, by the way. Yeah. Well, welcome to the show, to the podcast. I'm going to call you Dr. Sharps because I love that on your Instagram handle. Why did you become a pediatrician? It's something that I, that I had in my heart. There's... When you do stuff and you always want to help people and kids, Boy Scouts, there's always that feeling of helping. When I was probably around three or four years of age, my mom was actually carrying me and walking down this, the stairs and we fell together. I was the last couple of stairs. Then I flew over and had a huge chipotle, like a huge bruise in my head and I was bleeding and my mom, of course, was crying and it was like a full mess. Then. My mother actually brought me to my pediatrician and the pediatrician actually had a lollipop in his hand. And I started seeing the lollipop coming to my face and I was like, okay, at least, yes, I have a huge bruise and believe though I'm all messy and whatever, uh, but at least I'm going to get a lollipop. But suddenly that lollipop actually was given to my mom. And I went, wait, I'm the patient. You don't see the bleeding. I'm, I'm all bruised up. You see the blood on the t-shirt. And I understood something that pediatricians not only take care of the kid, but they take care of the family. And when you have that investment on the family, on the core part, because the pediatrician understood that if my mom was okay, I will be amazingly okay. Then that unity of what a pediatrician actually offers, it's whole, not only for the first 20 years, but actually for the rest of their, our lives as humans. Then a good pediatrician is virtually someone that invests their entire career, making sure that humans continue to do and have the most opportunities to be healthy, well, and actually achieve their dreams. And that's what actually my pediatrician showed me at that moment. And he was old school. He actually brought me, he will actually do home visits. He will come and call him at 3 a.m. And he will do even back. He did absolutely everything by himself. And I saw that as an opportunity to give back then. And, and I'm going to tell you a secret. I also, at the time that I needed to choose path, I was between pediatrics and geriatrics. And mm -hmm. there's a, yeah, it's like it was, the same. It's like the same. The, the, the thing is, at least with pediatric, like with, with our geriatric patients, there's a lot of things to do, but at least with the pediatric part, you have that feeling that you can push up the years, push up the wellness. Instead of just patching up whatever you did for the past 80 years. Absolutely. Now, was this experience in the U.S. or were you living in Mexico when you were a little child? Dr. Bravo, I, I was born and raised in Mexico City and I was there until I was like 27. And that was completely in Mexico City. Yeah, medicine used to be a lot simpler and so much more of a relationship than it is now. Times have gone by. You have a most interesting trajectory through your career, having graduated from medical school and Catholic university, probably ever seen the city of Mexico, and then going to Chicago for your residency. Then you went to, I think, Fort Myers. Correct. At a, at a fairly qualified health clinic. And then you went back to Mexico city and got an MBA. I actually did it from Los Angeles. I so was, you did it online? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I did everything. Yeah. George did the same thing at an MBA exactly. online. And then you moved to Los Angeles and you work for a not-for-profit called Altamed. Correct. 
Could you tell me more about Ultimate? What I read is fascinating. You guys have about 500,000 lives. Correct. Uh, everything started uh, almost 55 years ago. Uh, we have uh, uh, Black Panthers, and there was like a parallel movement for, for the Hispano community called Brown Beret. There was a lot of needs for health, a lot of needs for social justice, a lot of needs on the community. And it was, they didn't talk about it, but it was social determinants of health and being represented. Then in the East LA area, is Los Angeles area, they actually opened a free clinic. That, that meant that there was a room with two beds and volunteer doctors to come and do at least whatever can be done to take care of the community around them. Then it was old style, meaning that people will line for a little ticket at 5 a.m. to be seen at 9 a.m. if the doctor was there, then that was the transition from a community free clinic to more than 65 clinics, 500,000 patients, more than 500 doctors that we work there. And the idea of it is to continue serving the community. It's a fair qualified health center where we integrate in internal medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN, family practice. We actually brought a family residency inside of one of our clinics. That way we can actually train our doctors to serve the community. On the other side, we're making pipeline programs for med students, for nursing students, to make sure that anybody that actually has that each to serve the community has a path to go back to the same community that we have. It has been a pleasure because it's not only the part of just medicine, but also we do a lot of things outside of the four walls of the, our clinics. We do a lot of behavioral health. We go to a community to actually do health education and wellness. And we also talk a lot about civic health. And out of those 500,000, the, the lingo now is covered live or attributed lives that you have. How many of those are children? For 500,000 patients, we probably have 120, 150,000. Wow. Yeah. What is that? And what do you partner with the children's hospital to care for these children? It's one of those miracles that only happens rarely where a fair qualified health center actually works with one of the best hospitals, children's hospitals in the country. It could be like the fourth or the fifth or whatever, but it's on the top 10 for sure. Then. We could join forces to make sure that everybody actually has access to care, that it's what we want for any kid in the world, where we have a specialist. We actually, we do have a clinic inside of the children's hospital and a, a lot of the outpatient clinics, we work together. Then that, that's an amazing partnership where, you know, a lot of the times we worry about access and of course we can improve that anywhere in the world. But at least there's a fighting chance if we have a problem with orthopedics or a congenital thing or something on the heart that we can actually reach one of the best specialists that we have in the U.S. to serve our community. That's yes. very interesting because over here in New York, the federally qualified health centers, they do not go to the hospital to admit their patients. They do not see the patients in their newborn nursery. Their offices are generally open nine to four and never on Saturday or Sunday. And they see a couple of patients an hour. It's the opposite, it seems. Yeah. We, we, that, yeah. let me, one, one of the things that I love here is that the partnership goes above and beyond the four walls of the clinics. And when you actually have embedded the clinic there, uh, actually it helps a lot. And, and I am with you. I would love to do home visits and we do have a home visit program. I would love to do a lot. Then we have that flexibility where we have the technology part of it, the changing part of the healthcare system, the delivery system for a hospital, all integrated to one. Is it perfect? I would love to tell you that I have the perfect solution for absolutely everything, not yet, but we are working hard to make sure that we're moving forward to actually understand what we want with technology, what our patients need, and, and combine those forces that we have in our hands to make something better. And which children's hospital is this? And, and is it LA Children's or what is it? I don't know. C what they, they commonly call it CHLA. It's the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Okay. Okay. And I read that you have mental health embedded within the clinics. 
I'm sure you have a ton of care coordinators to help you navigate the system or the patients navigate the system, but you also have dentists. We and, have and all the, the, Dr. Bravo, when, when a patient actually comes with me to our clinics, I call it a miracle. And I call it a miracle because I know that from those 500,000 patients, I know that we are serving a lot of Medicaid, a lot of Medicare and people that actually cannot afford any of them. Then when they come to me, they are living their work, they're living, there's transportation things. Then when they come to us, the idea is to bring as much services on the same day as possible and coordinate that care with the behavioral health part, making sure that the, the referrals are as, as tight as possible. If we need a dentist to actually try to schedule it in a, in a way that you can serve that way, that day is an investment in their lives instead of a wasting day that they need to come back for labs or vaccines or, or whatever excuse we could have. Then we try hard to make sure that when they come to us, we're not just saying that bruise on their, their hand. We're actually, we, and then let me tell you what we are doing actually with kids. We have a dental medical integration system where any kid that comes to the pedi pediatric office, there's actually a dentist standing outside of my rooms where they come and do floor varnish, they do assessments, and if needed, they can actually do interventions. Most if it's something urgent on the same day, and if not, they can, that patient that came for vaccines already is taking care of those teeth that are so important in our kids. Wow, amazing, just amazing. Now, I'm fascinated because I don't think that we're training physicians properly anymore. We are, our training programs are heavily focused on very resource intensive hospital medicine. And I'm fascinated as to what is the family practice residency that you guys lead and how is it different from a regular residency program that George, you and I would uh, have encountered as we trained? The reality a lot of the times is that when we go out there in the community, Yes, we had all this experience on the hospital, but a lot of them are, are not compatible or you end up learning through the years and you have this three year memory or four year memory of your residency, but not a lot of schools that actually are serving your patients. You have seen a lot of complications. You have seen a lot of sick patients, but not necessarily the tools that you need on the community. Then what if, and this is how all these uh, community residencies were born. And, and we know already that. When you go to residency, on the area that you stay there and you lose fellowship, you start like rooting. You start like liking the place. It's harder to go back to your own community. Then serving the idea of having a local LA residency, having a community-led residency, and also having those community hospitals around them actually participate on the training, it's the perfect real tool belt that you need as a physician, as a pediatrician, as well, in this case, as family practitioners to actually have everything to go with your community. Then when they come in, the difference are that they are actually going to the hospitals of the community, being trained, they do their calls, they do absolutely everything. The outpatient follow-up clinics, the, the stuff that they do outpatients is without them in, on the community. Then. There's a direct connection of the patients that they are seeing with their community they are serving, and some of them from the community that they were born at. Then it's a beautiful cycle. And we know right now that pediatricians in general medicine, and especially us as, as, as doctors, that we have all these things on the past, we have the opportunity to give back, and, and they're giving back. Wow. Yes. And what you know what I'm noticing now? Because we have third year medical students and I poll them all the time. What are you going into? Either they'll say surgery or procedure things, or they'll say family medicine. It seems to be the new lingo that's going out there. They're pushing people because internal medicine, I think they're being told that's for hospitalist medicine. But if you want to work in an office clinic, it's family medicine. I'm going to tell you my, my, the problem that I have with that. Mm -hmm. I love kids. Mm -hmm. I hate blood. Then that goes with surgery or procedures. And the other thing is I, I love the OB part of OBGYN. 
right. or like GYN. Then if someone actually wanted to actually apply everything or confuse on where to go, family practice, it, it's an ample community based and we need family practitioners in the US. Oh. And especially right now that we have less decisions, we have a shortage, we, we have all these things that are cooking up then, but still, if you ask me right now, doctor, if I would do pediatrics again, oh yes. I will do it again and again. Maybe not an FPNC, but I will do it again. That will be my, my, my trend for sure. I always say pediatricians, we have the best job in the world. Our, the, the room smells nice. We're like rock stars most of the time. We're the most popular physician of all. Everybody likes us. And generally, we make everybody better. Or the kids get better by themselves. But <laughs> internal medicine, I don't know. It's not so easy. It's very hard. I, I feel bad for my friends. Dr. Sharps. What is a chief correspondent within such a large organization? Because that's your official title. So uh, I have, I'm thinking um, you're like a reporter, but you're not a reporter. So what, what is your job when you're not? I have a very interesting title. It's, I'm a senior vice president for the group. I'm the chief health correspondent and medical affairs officer. And, and it's actually tied with a story when I was actually a pediatric resident. Uh, in 2009, I, I had my uh, first pandemic, was a, the influenza yeah. pandemic, and I started seeing a lot of my patients and their families being very afraid, and a lot of them actually having complications, and not necessarily from influenza. They were getting complications from poor access to healthcare because they were afraid to come to the clinic or getting the vaccine or for whatever reason not accessing timely matter, the services that they needed. And I was very scared about that. And I was repeating myself again and again, this, this is actually what we need. This is the truth about the vaccine this, you know, and going 30 times a day with the same message. And I was like, there must be a, a better way to do this. Then I actually, and there was no information. There was no Google translate. There was no nothing that I actually started translating uh, a lot of the information to the Mexican consulate, to the uh, publishing department in Chicago to a lot of different pieces of what I perceive that people that actually had that megaphone, that amplifier of information, that I actually started writing everything in Spanish. And after that, part of it was that I came one day and one of the reporters was sick and I ended up giving my, the note that I was actually writing. Then after that, it started actually trickling down that if I actually wanted to give that message to 300,000 people in three minutes, the, it was not in my clinic. It was not on that part. Then I, I wanted to connect those dots of public health, making sure that we're communicating the information. And I don't call it education. I don't call it, it it's giving enough tools to our community that they have two or three jobs that they are running from one side to another in a language that can, they can understand. And by the way, that, that doesn't mean Spanish. It's translating medicalish to a language that it's actionable, meaning that at least they have enough tools to say, maybe, yes, I want to do this because of, or I don't want to do it. But the problem that I was perceiving was that a lot of people just get frozen and they get paralyzed with the idea of, of I have no idea what to do. I prefer not to do anything. And sometimes that's actually the worst outcome ever. And that's the, the part of communication. They, they do a, a ton of public health messaging with HHS, with, I actually used to do a lot of things with the White House uh, for, for Latino messaging, Office of Minority Health, locally here with tons of community health workers. I go out to the community to talk and have that, those conversations, even though that it's interesting because and, and I'm in the, in the house of pediatrics right now, a lot of people ask me like, why do you talk about breast cancer? Why do you talk? Because us as pediatricians, even though that, yes, our specialties kids, we see the entire realm and we are still doctors. We understand the dynamics of what's happening inside of the families, inside of the society, inside of all this stuff and that flexibility and that I will call it that gift that we have because it's a gift to actually be part of a family for 20 years and actually hear the most tough conversations of absolutely everything, like the divorce, the sexual transmitting infection from a family member, from what's actually happening with behavioral health. And all of that things actually opens a special place because a lot of the pediatricians, they're out there, they're actually in positions of public health. Then I love that part. Interesting. 
Yeah, that's very interesting. So a lot of it is just educating. And then what's the other role, the senior vice president? Are you oper well, is that operations or? I do mostly medical affairs. Uh, I got very frustrated a couple of years back. And things are changing. The healthcare system is changing. There's systems, there's in private equity. There's a lot of things moving. Then I was very voiceful and I was telling my thing, but unless we actually subscribe it in policy or we actually unite with different doctors and for the American Association, the AMA, and we, and I was very adamant from, for some of them, because they don't represent me. They clearly do not understand what I'm saying. Then the only way to actually do something about it is being there present and actually voicing out and representing our points of view. And there will be different points of view, but if we're not on the table, we're going to be the main dish. Then that's the part of medical affairs, making sure that the healthcare is represented of the communities that I serve and actually start to move it forward to make sure that we are all together on this. Okay. That sounds like a big job. It's a big job because most of the big systems, organizations or whatever, they don't see us pediatricians as very important. You do well baby checks, functional heart murmurs and runny noses. We have to tell them that we actually do exactly what you say. We're important. But most yep. people, we, we, we have to get that message out. And I think that's part of the mission of the Pediatric Lounge, to get that message out. Correct. Now... Why and how is it essential to communicate with our audience in Instagram? Things are changing. I, by the old days, meaning 10 years ago, TV was the king with absolutely everything. And us as pediatricians, we were trained to make sure that our patients survive, have a healthy life and get their vaccines and everything else. But we never were trained to communicate. We were never trained to actually go out there let alone TV or radio, but actually how to use your phone as, as a process to communicate with your patients. And that, and we saw it in COVID-19. There was a huge void of information there. There was silence on our part because we're trained to actually get evidence-based information, wait for the article and all that stuff. And that's a cycle of five years. Then when you have rapid response questions, when you have a lot of things that my patient needs now, like, the problems with sleeping right now, what's happening with measles. Like right now we have RSV, we have all this stuff that only we are there and we have the proper tools saying we can call it Instagram. We can call it TikTok. We can talk, talk about the YouTube, Facebook, any social media platform that you feel comfortable with. It's important to be there. But and we were uh, talking before the, the most important thing right now is to make sure that you're present, real and giving the, the evidence-based information. And. It's not about 500,000 uh, followers or a million or 50 or what. It's, it's just being there and opening another door of communication. It doesn't need to be painful. It needs to be fun for us as pediatricians because we're already doing a couple of things a day and we are running from one side to another, but also that needs to be evidence-based and, and share our voice. It was very interesting. I have to give credit to Dr. Bravo for this genius idea. For our physicians, we created these little short videos, five minutes, seven minutes of things that will happen at your particular well visit at two weeks, at two months, four months, six months, right? Talking a little bit about some of the bright future, future stuff, what vaccines you're going to get. I put some pictures of measles and chicken pox or whatever. And we have the more senior physician and a junior physician where I, I would talk about, yes, I did see measles. Yes, I did see chicken pox. Dr. Scott never saw it. He like a little conversation between the two of us to help promote vaccines, bright futures. But the idea was, it's the same message that you give each and every time. Instead of having the doctor sit in a room for 10, 15 minutes talking down to this patient, you're giving them the information first, and then you go into the room. I usually say to them, oh, did you see that text message that we sent you that the doctors would like you to watch this video? More and more people are saying, yes, do you have any questions? Some people will say, I have a question about this. Most of them will say, you've answered all of my questions. Then you can have a little back and forth of a little Johnny's two years old. Make sure he doesn't jump off the table and break his neck, fall in the swimming pool, and just a conversation about things. And that expedites the work. 
But I am finding, especially with the younger physicians, they do not engage this. I don't know why. The senior guys are doing it because they're seeing that it is helping them to speed them up a little bit so they don't get so bogged down. But the younger people can't let it go. And they also don't want to produce any of these videos. That's the interesting it's, piece of it. I, I think that there's some. Say, well, no, we, this is a moment of challenge. I, I think that we should, and that I have seen your Instagram post with uh, everything that you have been doing with the Electric Lounge. I think yeah, that's a nice challenge to put. Who can actually create the best five, let's put it this, five minute videos from well business from zero to 12? Because I think that those are mo the most. Heavy duty, the the ones that actually can make a huge difference. Right. Then that could be a nice challenge to see where yeah. who can and we can have some Starbucks coffee yeah. uh, cards over there and uh, get some people excited with it. Yeah. Yeah. No. But very interesting thing where this is Dr. Bravo doesn't agree with me on this, and I think it's important. We set it up where we have a little PowerPoint with some bullet points of different things that we're talking about, more for us to be able to make the conversation go, so we don't forget something. But people are taking pictures of those screens. So now I had to put actually the PDFs versions of it because people download it and they read it. Why? I don't know. But if you think about it, the most common thing that I've heard from people was they accept the information because it's their pediatricians giving it to them. Because you could go online and find all this stuff anywhere, produced a thousand times better, but it doesn't have that homely but doctor thing. It's some corporation that produced well, baby, checks at two, four, and six month videos. What do you think, Dr. Bravo? This was oh, maybe your idea. I think they have to be very short because very short, yes. We have very short attention spans. So yes. if you try to put in what Bright Futures uh, says you should talk about in a two month old visit on a video, that'll take you two hours and nobody's going to watch it. Yeah. So, but well, you have to pick a happy out of the two so, you pick. You could so do you it in the to, room or you could do well, it on the no. You have to break it up into very small snippets, one minute, simple messaging yeah. um, so that people will listen to it. And then, yes, if they have a question about why should I get the measles vaccine today that you talked about, then you can expand on that because you know, people come in with different interests or different questions into the exam room. As I say, no two human beings are born the same. You could be born from Mexican parents in Los Angeles the same day, both boys, both with the same today, they're going to be totally different because that's just humanity. Yeah. Uh, and our job, I feel, not to come into the room with an agenda of, I'm going to talk to you about this right now. The parent may not be interested in that. My job is to answer their question. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. That's my job. They're paying for my time to answer their questions. Then we can talk about all the other stuff. But if I don't meet their needs, they're not going to trust me. And that's a problem. We become too scripted, too pathway driven. Mm -hmm. And we, we're humans. We don't come out with a, from the assembly with a book that says, this is the operating manual for her problem. At so many miles, change the oil. But people come in with questions, and if we don't ask their questions, that we don't answer those questions, I don't see what value I bring into the exam room. And I think that's where I think you have to be careful. You can't be too scripted. I and think the EHRs create script. Much worse. But all these, all these bullet points and pathways, you cannot let that deter from the relationship. The, the most important thing is the relationship and meet the needs of the parents. Correct. And you can't do that because you're too busy. What call it whatever you want, EHR, right futures guidelines. I I don't care. AS, the ASQs are wonderful, but they're very long. And and if a parent doesn't have any concerns, they're like, "Why well, am I filling all this out for? It's wasting ten minutes of my time. I got to get back to work." So I think you just have to be mindful when you use these tools that answer the patient's concerns first, and then do what you think is your work. Because otherwise you lose your audience. That's just my thoughts on it. You have some thoughts, Dr. Sharps. The, on, on reality, I think that it, it comes by waves. We go and we swing and it comes to my mind the part of we will never give 
cold milk formula to kids. And we swung all the way, cold milk, that's the best formula. And right now we actually opened the door that cold milk is not that bad. And actually can benefit a couple of patients in it's as effective, at least on the nutritional aspects, all that stuff on formula for kids. Then I, I think that we are swinging right now and we swung all the way to making sure that we have protocols. We are like a pilot, making sure that we have all our checklists that we were really bad before we were doing more art than science as physicians. And we right now doing only science. Then I, I think that we need a balance, exactly. need a balance. Bringing back to the part of, and the, I love how you say it, Dr. Bravo, the, that frustration is real. Like how much documentation we need to do because that actually passes up and down and to a lot of people, but what's the balance between me and my patient and their family to make sure, because it, I, I'm certain the kid, yes, parents are there and everything else, but how can we do that connection at all levels in that, in that efficient way? Yeah. 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 It, that, that can't be scripted. I don't know if it can be taught. Or you learn it from seeing pe people and conversations over and over again. It's, I think the hardest part of medicine, not only pediatrics, is how to communicate with your patients in a way that, that you're building trust in a relationship and you're answering their questions because their questions may have nothing to do with science. They just, they have some fear in their mind. And if you can allay that fear, then you get to do what you need to do. And I don't know how you learn that. It's just, it, it takes. I think you, you learn it in the examination room, but you learn it in medical school because I'm, I have 30 medical students and they start off working with me. They're really good at the computer, really good. They're really poor at the social skills. So I tell them, if you learn anything from me, learn to leave the computer behind and do the physician patient relationship, talk to people, examine people. And then write your progress note or do both at the same time. But they're so super hyper-focused on that darn computer that they forget that the patient is in the room. So I pull them away and it happens every single month. And by the end of the month, these kids are talking, they're engaging, they're acting like physicians. Hopefully they carry on in the future and they don't get tarnished with other rotations in the hospital and internal medicine and whatnot. But at least I tried. Yeah. Yeah. So I have, this is a very heavy question because we hear a lot about value-based medicine. And I think at Optimed, you're actually doing value-based medicine. But We are. But is it possible really to do value-based medicine in pediatrics when there is no cost savings because we're already moving the, a lot of the children, not all, but a lot of the children through prevention, early diagnosis, vaccination, screening, we're moving them into a healthier status. So can there really be value-based contracting if you're not doing adult medicine? I love the question. And by definition, the idea of value-based care is moving away from be, you see your doctor, you pay your doctor, and maybe you actually needed to talk with a nutritionist. Or maybe you actually needed to talk with a psychologist that, or, or a different a podiatrist and everything is embedded on the same system. Then healthcare, as we know, yes, us as pediatricians, also as physicians, we need to be there completely. But sometimes for the patient, they do not, if they call for a vaccine, they can go directly with a the nurse. Then figure out who is actually the best representative to take care of the patient for that part. And that's actually, I'm just... That part is just inside of the genius, but also what are they eating? Do they need actually a food coach to go out there and, and do like a couple of rounds to the supermarket to figure out, yeah, there's two pastas, but which one is better? Or how to, how can we choose vegetables that are affordable, but also good? Is it better the frozen ones or not? Then there's a lot of things that when, when you do not have that transactional part of fee for service and you have value-based gear and you you have already that money, you can actually be more innovative. We'll give you a couple of examples. What was it? Probably five years ago, we embedded a couple of psychologists, PhDs that were doing a fellowship in mental health for kids. Then we embedded them inside of our clinics 
and we were working pediatricians high by the psychologist. And when we had a tough conversation or someone that actually could benefit of that interaction, we just plugged them in. That was actually not billable. That was, there was no space for that. Then we have a human being there and another human being there, two a physician and also a, a PhD working together. And that sadly has a, a dollar sign attached to it. And that interaction brings more value to, at that moment, to my patient, because we were actually talking about suicidal ideation, anorexia, bulimia, bullying, all these things that rarely you get to approach and solve on the same visit. And it's, let me send you out for the referral. But unless you have value-based care where you actually are seeing the system as a whole and you're actually bringing services that make a difference, and not, it's not necessarily the physician or the psychologist, could be the, the dental medical integration that I was talking to you about, then at least we have that leverage of bringing that to our community. And I'm going to give you another example right now. As a, as a pediatrician, sadly, in the past two years, I have had patients that actually achieve the level to actually quantify for bariatric surgery. And I have seen that trend going up and it was coming before the COVID-19. Right now it's actually there. Then I have sent patients for liver biopsies because the, the, the liver enzymes were to the roof. I started actually medications for hypertension, for cholesterol control, stuff that kids do not need to have, but that's the society that we're living in. That's a reality that we need to change. Then unless they have a, a community health worker, a promotor that goes to their parents and talks to them and actually helps them figure out things at home. And I actually have, you have me as, uh, as the physician, we have the nutritionist, we have the psychologist and also that type of uh, behavioral movement or program around the kid that usually with before service, it, it's not existent, but I know that this thing of connecting the promotor, the community health worker, with the nutritionist, with all that stuff, it's a dream that we can actually achieve doing value-based care. Then, even though that we have a contracting part of it, but it gives you a lot of leverage on the things that actually your patients need. I agree with you 100%. Okay, you should have those things. Everybody blames the fee-for-service as the evil. I don't think that's the evil. It's the lack of fee-for-service that's the evil, okay? Um, because you have a community of the federally qualified health center and you have social workers, psychologists, great idea. Who pays for that? Because I'm sure the psychologist does not work for free. George, I, I don't think it's fee-for-service versus value. Yeah, they, no, this will be a combo of the two. Uh, in my mind. The problem is we're not investing enough in children. Yes, we know that. And, and so the reason, and we, we can get a little bit political, I'm not being political, but Kennedy did a really great thing. President Kennedy did a really great thing. What they used to be called the insane asylums, where they threw people with schizophrenia, psychosis, and many of them were tortured in the 60s, it was not a good model. So he tried to move that out to the community. and quickly they realized there's not enough psychiatrists to do the outpatient intensive therapy that these human beings, these persons need. So we're going to, and I'm sorry for the term, we're going to use mid-level providers to do all the psychotherapy yeah. and the psychiatrist is going to function at the top of their license, only prescribe medications, but they're going to work together as a team to get these people better. Great. They never funded the program. You can't find a psychiatrist today that will see you and do therapy in America. They don't do it. You want a med check, it's $150 cash. Otherwise they don't do it. You want to, I was trying to, the same experience that Dr. Sharps had, and I'm going to be very honest in the air. And I don't mean this in a prerogative way about the general practitioner in Mexico, Costa Rica, or Colombia, where you can get a license without going through a residency program. I wrote for Lasix and um, met Foreman on a 17 year old with an STD, with always 250 pounds, pre diabetic, with a blood pressure of 140 over 90. And I feel like I'm a quack. 
I don't know how much medicine to write for hypertension. I don't know what the long-term side effects of treating someone with an LDL to 130 who's 17 is. Do I use Lipitor or do I use Crestor? There is no evidence. What do these medicines do to your liver if you take it for 40 years? I don't know. I'm just basically saying, okay, I have a script back. I can't change his behavior. So here's a Lasix, here's the metformin, and I'm going to pray that this works out for us. But we need to invest in these disease processes. And we need to, this is a lighter question, but we also need to think about, there's some great miracles coming along for pharma and they change the trajectory of disease processes. So for example, you can get a two and a half million dollar medicine today and you are no longer a patient with sickle cell disease. From the patient's point of view, from what I like to fix problems, I think it's phenomenal. But how do we make that investment? Because that payout happens over many decades. It doesn't happen this quarter or next six months. It happens over years. And we don't have a system to do that. So we can argue a lot about value-based fee-for-service. Fee-for-service would work great. I had another patient so, so uh, came in for abdominal pain, ninth, ninth grader. I've never seen an a PHQ-9 with so many threes in it, suicidal ideation. Mother had abruptly stopped her Prozac and her ADHD medicines. I know what she needs. She's self-harmed. She's tried to commit suicide before. She needs DBT. But to find a DBT therapist in Northern Virginia, they only take cash and it's $200 a week. How many families can afford $1,000 a month for three or six months to get their kid better. Correct. You have to be more than upper mid middle class. Yep. So if you don't have a system that can provide that, it's not fee for service, it's not value. It's just the funding isn't there. You can't fix the problem. What's interesting when the funding is there, it works. As we had one of the hospital systems wanted to do a behavioral health to embed a social worker in our offices. And we gave them a room and she was there all the time. And we would give a warm handoff for a person, a patient. Quickly, we got her up to 350, 400 patients, right? And it was very good for the docs. It was good for her and everything was great. But the system started to do all the, they didn't give her a secretary. She had to do a lot of administrative work on her own besides seeing the patients. And then what do you think happened? They pulled the plug because funding went away. The grant was over. Yes. They couldn't make it work. Now, a system cannot make this work. How is an independent person supposed to make it work? No, but, but again, so I, I think you're right. That this needs to be funded. And some of the, like, Altamad, I'm sure, has a lot of grants and has other resources that pull this in that they can make it work. Mm -hmm. A one-person pediatric practice is not going to be able to spend the time to get right. this in. Correct. But the problem is we need the funding. We need the funding. I have a, another quick question. I bet you do a lot of screening on, on Ultimate. And how, again, how do you explain, for example, I don't know if you're screening for diabetes yet or C-like disease in the office, but how do you explain to the patients the importance of screening for things like anemia, lead? that are so important, but everybody just thinks it's a finger poke, who cares? It's, it's quite interesting because I, I, I tend to have two, two types of patients. One, that it's the old school, that like, give me absolutely everything, be, bring Dracula, make sure that my kid, every ounce liquid and everything else, I went analyze and give me all the results. And I have the other ones that go like, thank you, no thank you, I, I'm okay not doing any screening then. And the, the, those are extremes. Usually the conversation that we want to have is that we have done a lot of things and we can prevent a lot of things. And um, when we do the screening is that a lot of people, we can actually miss stuff that it's very common. Anemia, for example, that you were noticing. Or like right now, for example, that I, I started actually with a newborn screen, that it's a very simple way to open the, the, the door about screening. is making sure that we can actually 
prevent something or we can fix something quickly, it's way better, especially when our kids are growing. And I always have the conversation with the parents and family members that kids are not small adults. They actually move faster and their body actually changes more. And that's why we see them more often because we want to see if there's any variable that is changing to actually give them the tools and help that they need to make it better or at least to neutralize it or at least to move it away from harm. Then that's part of the important things about screening. Then, and actually, apart from blood screening and everything else, we are doing uh, adult childhood event screenings and for the parents and mothers and, and also for the kids. And we are doing a lot of other, for example, uh, maternal depression, postpartum stuff. Then we're integrating a lot of other stuff that we never did before. And we're slowly moving out of from paper to actually have it inside of a tablet or their patient's phone. That way we put all the information about anemia, mental health, actually seeing the, not just, yes, he, he has lead, he doesn't have lead, but actually seeing my patient as a whole. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Thank you very much. We're going to turn Thank a little you. bit to Spanish. 